And so we, we look forward to that time. And we have to live here now. So how do we live here and now? Well, let's, let's look here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, we had finished with 1 Corinthians chapter 11 several weeks ago. And we took a little break. We'll come back to it. We'll probably go through these next three chapters uh, in uh, good order. And we'll take another break and cover some other things and come back to finish uh, 1 Corinthians uh, uh, Somewhere down the line, let's put that one. Uh, uh, listen to some podcasts and things that uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, reformers, uh, Calvin, for instance, spent years going through one verse at a time through whole books of the Bible. And, uh, of course, uh, he had an advantage. Well, an advantage, I guess we could do the same thing. He preached every day. Uh, he preached on Sunday morning. He preached Sunday night. He preached Monday morning, Monday night, Tuesday morning, Tuesday. <laughs> you can get a lot of scripture in when you do that over a period of time. But uh, we're here. We're going to look at God's word, and we're going to try as best as we can, by, in, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, to obey those things which God puts before us today. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 11. Let me read that to you quickly. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. And he, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge and by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but all these work in the one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word, that we are not left to wander in the wilderness of ignorance, but we can come to understand exactly what you would have us to do concerning spiritual gifts. Now speak to our hearts today that we might walk worthy of you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everything in the Christian life is a gift. Everything. Everything. God gave His only Son to pay the debt of our sins. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is the Father that draws us to the Son, according to John chapter 6, verse 44. No man can come to me, Jesus said, except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So that's a working of God, a gift that he gives to us. It is God also who gives repentance to a soul. And that's found in, in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, pardon me, not chapter 2, but 2 Timothy chapter uh, 2, verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to acknowledge the truth. And then also it is God that gives repentance, uh, pardon me, it is God uh, who give, as a gift teaches a soul to seek Christ. We have to be taught. 
In fact, uh, Jesus said there in, in John chapter 6, verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Sometimes we think that it's all left up, up to us, but God is the one who has to be at work. We can preach, we can teach, we can give out tracts, we can, we can beg people, we can plead with people, we can bleed blood for people, but until God begins to work in the heart, there's no salvation. It is a free gift from God, and we need to understand that. In verse 8 of chapter 2 of Ephesians, we read... Uh, uh, we haven't read it, with, but it says, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, the gift of God. So God even gives us faith. And we could go on and on and on. All these things are gifts. All good things come from God. All good things come from God. And we should trust Him and rely upon Him. He gives these to Christians. We won't pay particular uh, attention this morning to spiritual gifts that God gives to each and every believer in Christ. No one's excluded. You know, <clears throat> there's some people who think that their gift is coming to church on Sunday morning. That that's their gift. That's not your gift. You know, you, know, you don't just come to church. You are a part of the church and you have to have to be a part of it and to minister to one another with the gifts that God gives you, even to be able to minister to those who are outside of Christ, those who have not trusted Christ. We need God's Holy Spirit to work, and we need to use those gifts that God has given us to, as a means of bringing them to faith. 1 Corinthians 12 begins a new section in this letter, and it covers three chapters. One chapter is only 13 verses long, so that makes it kind of easy. That's not too hard. But the other chapters are rather long, and we'll try to break them up in such a way that we can uh, not just dwell on this forever and ever. But God wants us to focus our attention on these spiritual gifts. For the next three chapters, Paul deals with the spiritual gifts, their importance, their use, and their abuse. So let's look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, and learn from it. He begins with, now concerning spiritual gifts. Some of you may have a version of the Bible. When you read that, when you look at uh, the, all the words, you'll, you'll have, now concerning spiritual gifts. And that word gift is italicized. Why is it italicized in your Bible? Is that a means of emphasizing that word? You know, sometimes I do that. If I'm writing notes, I'll either put bold type on it or I will uh, put italics on it so that I can see or underline it. Well, this is not that case. When it, a Bible translation has a word italicized, it's indicating that the, the uh, translators want to make sure that you understand that that word was not in the original Greek, but the context indicates that it should be there for our understanding. You know, translating from one language to another is a difficult thing to do. And there's certain words in Spanish I cannot pronounce. There's a, there's a, a there's a word all I can hear when I hear it is Monday. Do you know which word that is? It's it sounds like Monday, and that's all it goes into my ear, but it's a greeting word. I can't, you know, my, my co-worker uses it all the time. When somebody comes in the store, she says, and it sounds like Monday. She has pronounced it to me several times. I cannot pronounce it right, but it sounds like Monday to my ears, you know. And so uh, <clears throat> translating from even, you know, verbally or in writing from one language to another, it gets difficult. And this indicates that word is added for clarity. The beginning phrase actually says in the Greek, now concerning spiritual. This is spiritual things that we're talking about. This is not carnal things. I did a quick study. Well, you know, it's curious. 
I wonder how many times is the word spiritual used in 1 Corinthians? How many times is it used? And I didn't write it down in my notes, but it's used like 21 or 24 times that it's used. And I got to think, well, what about carnal? Well, it does use the word carnal at the earlier part. It, it's uh, immature for immaturity, for uh, being uh, like an unbeliever in your actions, but maybe not in your, your actual heart. And so the word spiritual, though, dominates uh, 1 Corinthians. It's there all the way through. It, it, okay, here it is. I do have it in my notes. Uh, mentioned 16 times, 16 times in 16 chapters. And so the word spiritual is very important. Paul desires that the Corinthians not be ignorant. He says, I would not have you ignorant. Now, who is he talking to? Well, the verse, uh, the verse says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. So he's talking to believers, those who have put their faith in Christ. He doesn't want them to be ignorant. Now, an ignorant person can be taught. A stupid person is a whole lot more difficult to teach than it is to teach an ignorant person. Ignorant means you just don't know any better. Stupid means you, if, even if you knew, you probably wouldn't be uh, doing what you need to do. It's better to be ignorant than to be stupid, in other words. Uh, I mean, you can act like a stupid donkey, or you can uh, trust Christ and live like a wise man, like the wise man that built his house upon the rock. Remember what, go back in our life, Paul begins in verse 2, he says, Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led, demonically led. They were being led by people who are in the world are being led, unknowing to them, by demonic spirits. And I'm not one of these, find a, find a demon under every rock. I'm not that kind of a person. But we have to admit that there is demonic activity that goes on in our world. And that demonic activity is to lead people astray. Now the Gentiles, these, and, and for the most part the Corinthians were Gentiles. Uh, they had grown up with their life experience. They went to the, the temples. They had these idols. They had an idol for everything. You know, in India today, it, we, the statistics keep changing because they come up with new idols every year in that country. There are millions of idols in India. It is the second largest country in the world, about to become the largest country in the world, population-wise. And for the most part, there are Hindus and there are some uh, pagan uh, other religions that are there, but mainly there are Hindus and they have millions of gods. Every family has their own pet god. You may, some of you may have been here years ago when I preached the sermon on Pet Rock. You remember that? Years ago? Everybody has their own Pet Rock, you know, and that's basically what, what they have. They were Gentiles, these Corinthians, and they were carried away unto these dumb idols. They were, all the people were greatly involved in this, and they, they participated in this idolatry. And so... Uh, I want you to know that, that they uh, had this experience. That's the experience they came from. But they weren't that anymore. But it's hard for us to take what was in our past life and push it aside and not have it influence our present life. And we're all that way. We're all that way. We grow up with certain things. I mean, <laughs> we, uh, you can't take Texan out of a Texan. I just be blunt. I mean, I, I was born a Texan. I was raised a Texan. I was there for over 50 years. Uh, took one trek to Arkansas and said, nope. And came back <laughs> and lived the rest of that time until I came here in Texas. And so I'm a Texan born and raised and uh, have, still have a heart for Texas. But, you know, it's hard to change because we are that way. We get used to things. And so we take this former life 
uh, uh, for the, the Corinthians did, took the former life as being Gentiles, and some of them, not all of them, but some of them tried to bring those very same kind of things into the worship in the church. Things that they used to do with the idols, they brought into the church. And I'll talk more about that later. They had fallen into the deception of the false idols and uh, exercised by some. Uh, and, and, and the false idols had, had the people who worshipped them had spiritual gifts. The, the ones who seemingly were closer would act out spiritual gifts to their idol that were similar to what was being acted out in the Corinthian church. And some of those things that were being acted out couldn't be even divided from the idols from the worship that they were worshiping. They were still just like it. Well, that's not Christianity. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And that was a problem. They looked on those ecstatic utterances that were associated with the idols as a special relation with the idols, and then they concluded that that was also a way to have a special relationship with God, with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they brought these things in. It was fake. It was not real. And in their ignorance, they added this to their new faith in Christ. Some were doing and saying some odd things when they were in this, their ecstatic state. In verse 3 says, Wherefore I give to you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a cursed, and that no man could say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now you say, well, there's a lot. You can say things. You know, you know I, we hear... Uh, when we baptize a person, we baptize them, and when we baptize them, we say these words. Upon your profession of faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But why do we use the word profession? Because I can't see your heart. I can't see your heart. But God can see your heart. God knows what's real and what's not. God knows whether you know what you're doing or whether you don't know what, I, what you're doing. Been there and done that with baptism. I got baptized, didn't know what, what it was all about. I was not saved. I thought I was saved, but I was not saved. And then I got saved. And I, then I, I got baptized. That baptism was one that was real because the other one, I just got wet. Because it wasn't real from my heart. There was no change in my life. But the, the Corinthians were having this problem. They actually had people who were supposedly under the, uh, in the Spirit, and they were speaking in tongues, and they were calling Jesus accursed. They were cursing Jesus in the church. That's sad. That's so sad. Paul makes it clear that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse. The person led by and under the influence of the Holy Spirit will always proclaim that Jesus is Lord. Even if it means they sacrificed their life, which many of them did, did and there's many who will do that in our day. The day is fast coming upon us when we're going to have to make a choice. Is Jesus Lord? Or is society, the culture Lord? Or is, is the government Lord? Or is there a person who is Lord? No, there's only one Lord. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a hint here, um, again, about that practice of idolatry being brought into the church and mingled with true worship. Now, I want to tell you this happen is happening in so many ways today. Spiritual music is being replaced by carnal and sensual music of this world. It will have Christian language in it, but it is by the beat and by the, the, the wording, it's all meant to appeal to the, uh, to the flesh, 
to the, the uh, sensual part of our lives. The pulpit in many churches has been done away with and put off to the side and this up here has become the stage. And they, you have a performer who performs on the stage and we've talked about this so many times but you have people sad to say I had a friend of mine years ago that uh, brought a pontoon boat, not pontoon boat, uh, what, what's, what's the, the boat that the uh, uh, Cajun shoes, the flat bottom boat, brought it into the, the church and preached from the pontoon, uh, from, from the, the, uh, the uh, flat boat, I think that's what it's called. John boat. John boat, from the John boat. Uh, had another preacher that I knew of that, BMA preacher, just make clear of you, <laughs> you understand this, Preach from the rooftop of the church. It got, got people noticing. They got in the paper. They got recognized. I got asked to come and preach a view of call of that church a, a few years after that. They were trying to appeal to the flesh and I've seen this done, and sometimes Christians fall into this. I can remember back at Oak Crest where I was saved that uh, we had a contest with another church. I can't remember what the, the uh, results of the contest were or what the reward would be, but we had a contest on Sunday school attendance. You know, if we had X number uh, more than the other, then, then, you know, how that all works out, you just had this contest. That's so carnal. And we all can fall into that because we live in this world and the, the world influences us. We have to be very careful that we uh, put ourselves in the right place uh, or we'll end up doing what is done in so many churches today. They're entertaining souls on their way to hell. And it's sad. The Lord is not pleased with such things as this. Remember what happened. I have to have you go... Uh, back and study your Bible a bit. Remember what happened to Nadab and Abihu when they offered strange fire on the altar. That's in Leviticus chapter 10. Take time and read it. This is what's said in verse 3. This is what the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me and before all the people, I will be glorified. That's what God wants to happen in any of his churches. The churches that belong to Jesus. Now moving on. The gifts of the Holy Spirit involve three, all three persons of Godhead. In verse 4 it says there are diversities of gifts. Verse 5 it says there are differences of administration. Verse 6 says... And there are diversities of operations. And then it has a phrase after each one of them. It says, but the same Spirit, but the same Lord, but the same God which worketh all in all. The word that is used for diversities and for differences is the same word in the Greek. And it means the same thing as diversities. It's diversities. There are diversities of operations. There are diversities of of administrations. There are diversities of gifts. And that's true. God loves diversity. I mean, you can't just have one butterfly that looks one way. You have to have millions of butterflies that look a hundred million different ways. Right? <laughs> and you even have some that change color on you. I mean, you have to accept the wonderful grace of God that does so many things in so many beautiful ways. We don't all have to be alike, but we all have to submit to God who is the leader of it all. Note that the Trinity of God is demonstrated here in the gifts. Same Spirit, same Lord, same God that works in all in all. The Greek word translated diversity and difference is the same word, which I've already said. Just as God created diversity of creatures in the world, so He has given great diversity of gifts to the saints. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are united together 
in the gifts given to his people and used to bless all and blesses all. The least of the people of God are given spiritual gifts just like he gives to the greatest of the people of God. You know, we, we look like uh, look at a person like Billy Graham or as uh, former President Trump uh, this last week called a little blurb and, and he was commenting on um, uh, Franklin Graham. And Franklin Graham had uh, chastised him a little bit about the use of profanity in his speeches, which he rightfully should do so, and, uh, and everything. But he talked about how great a man he was. Well, Franklin Graham may be a great man, but every child of God has been given the Holy Spirit, and through the Holy Spirit, every child of God has been given gifts, not just one, but multiple gifts that he has given to each and every one of us. He is at work in all of his children in Christ Jesus our Lord. So it's a wonderful thing that he does. Verse 7 talks about the manifestation of the Spirit. Manifestation. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Just think of it, just what it says. The, everyone has been given a manifestation, a gift of the Spirit for the purpose of of profiting everybody in the church. We're all together. We'll look at this later. But I was thinking about this. You know, if uh, you had if you had a, a leg that was longer than the other leg, you'd be partially crippled. If you had an eye that did not develop fully and you would be partially blind. In the same way with the tongue, you would be a stutterer. We all have to have the Spirit working in us to minister to each other, to each other. The Holy Spirit bestows a diversity of gifts to each and every believer in Jesus for the common good of all. At this point, we are... Uh, we are uh, given a list of gifts given to the saints. There are several lists of gifts given in the New Testament, and uh, uh, not two are the same list. And I'm going to say something about that. I believe the lists are not meant to be a complete, final list of the gifts. They're not meant to be that. They're a sample. In in many cases, and I believe it's in the Corinthian case, there are gifts that are listed here that are not listed anywhere else. Because these were the gifts that were being manifest in the Corinthian church. Some of them were real, and some of them were fake. And Paul is trying to get them to understand some things. And so we're not going to use any list. I did this years ago. Years ago, uh, it, well, I think First Baptist in... in uh, for, uh, in uh, Athens did this. They handed out this list of gifts. And we were all to try to figure out what our gifts are. And I studied on it, I studied on it. Years, years later, I finally realized that the best way to find out what your gift is is gift to serving God and serving His people. And I guarantee you, your gift will be made manifest. How will it be made manifest? Those that you are loving and serving will tell you what your gift is. You don't have to wait for you to figure it out. They'll figure it out for you. And you'll be so blessed because you, without even knowing it, have been using the spiritual gift that, the God, that God has given you and you didn't even realize it. Just by getting together and getting into service. Each and every true gift of the Spirit comes from the Holy Spirit and is meant to unite us together. Any gift that is given or any gift that is used in a church that divides the people is not a gift from the Holy Spirit. It is meant to bring us together, not to divide us apart. The gifts of the Spirit are for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, according to Ephesians 4, verse 12. 
And let me close with this. Verse 11. But all these worketh the same and the self, uh, worketh the one and self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. The Holy Spirit is the one who determines what gifts we are to have. I don't make that decision. You know, you, you have people who say, you know, I am determined I am going to be a preacher. Well, unless God calls you, you're not meant to be a preacher. And if you think that you're called, and he doesn't give you the gifts, and there's no evidence he's given you the gifts, then you want to examine whether that's the proper call or not. The Holy Spirit is at work. The church does not designate the gifts of the Spirit, neither does the pastor, and neither do you determine the gifts that he gives to you. It is like salvation. <coughs> These are gifts from God. How should we receive God's gifts? Well, how do we receive any gift? We receive it with joy. You know, if somebody gives me anything, how should I respond? I should be happy. I should be joyful about it. And I should be thankful. And I should... Show love to the person who's given me that gift. And just like we receive Jesus, we receive the gifts by faith. You say, well, Brother Rick, I don't know what my gift is. Don't worry about it. As I said, if you'll just get to loving and serving people, the evident gift that, that God has given you will come to the, the surface Everybody will know it. You won't have to be worrying about what it is because everybody will know what your gift is. And then when you start worrying about it, and you try to, to force something, you say, well, I, I'm going to seek after this, I'm going to do this. That's not the way it happens. Just seek the Lord and serve others in Christ and, and in the world as well. Serve everybody. Then God will show you what the gift is that he has given you by his spirit. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Well, what's the unspeakable gift? It's Jesus. The greatest gift of all. We didn't have any choice. He came to us. Sought us out. And I will tell you, if you don't have Jesus, talking about gifts to you is not... It's not going to be a benefit of all. If you don't have Jesus in your heart, the Holy Spirit's not there in your heart, then you, you don't need gifts. You need the gift, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. These gifts that we've been talking about are given to the church and to individual believers. And I want to remind you, remember how Adam and Eve were given everything that they needed. Everything. They, there was nothing that they lacked except clothes. And that was before they needed them. Okay. And when they needed them, God gave them the clothes. Amen? But they they needed nothing. An old slew foot Satan comes around in the form of the serpent and says, you don't have everything you need. Have God said. And tempts them to take of that tree. They could have every tree in the garden. They had no, they had no uh, worry about what they needed. Uh, 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 needed to live, they they were they would prosper. They could enjoy a life that God gave them. They they even have a, had a job to do. It wasn't like they would be idle. They they would they were supposed to dress the garden. They were supposed to keep the garden and take care of it. They were prosper. They had everything they they needed for food, for labor, for life. But they chose death, which is the very thing that a person does. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Wage is something you earn. It's what you earn. It's not something that's given to you benevolently. It's something you earn. The wages of sin is death. But God is gracious. God is so gracious. The past is a gift. 
Pardon me. They pass on this gift uh, on to us, the gift of their fallenness. And we earn the uh, death penalty because of our sin. But God is gracious. Death is swallowed up in victory. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What does He require of us? Do we climb some mountain or we, we uh, go through some ritual? No. He requires of us that we repent and trust in Jesus to forgive our sins. And then we begin following Him as our Lord and our Savior. Now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, it's not the next day. Now is the day of salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You say, Brother Rick, that sounds too simple. That's the problem. That's the problem. You think you have to earn salvation. You don't earn salvation. You receive salvation as a free gift. And you receive the gift, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, who comes into your life and gives you life eternal. I pray that you would put your faith and trust in Jesus today. And you and I who are Christians, we have such a wonderful blessing of being given the Holy Spirit. If any man have not the Spirit of God, he's none of his. The Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. We have the Spirit of Christ. He lives in us. In my testimony, I, I've shared it so many times. I remember telling the, the pastor when I went forward, I said, I don't have Jesus in my heart. But I did. When I, when, back to that pew where I, I was standing that day, at that point right there, when I put my faith in Jesus right back there, I got Jesus in my heart because I trusted him. I depended upon him. I wasn't depending upon me. I couldn't say I was good. I, all I could say is I need Jesus. Someone here the last week or so said, the way that you show that you're saved is when you say, I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I have nothing to commend me before God. I need Jesus. I need Him. And folks, everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for Your love and Your grace. We thank You for Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. The one You sent to die in our place to pay the penalty of our sin. Who we have received by faith and now trust in Him. You have given us of your spirit and you have given us the gifts that we need to serve not only you, but also to serve this lost world and also every believer in Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to understand and to be obedient to you and to take up our cross and follow Jesus if need be and die for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ who has been shown to us all who believe. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Now, bless us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.